This conference will now be recorded. Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our uh, Honorable Secretary General, Dr. G.P. Agarwal and Dr. Sanjeev Layak, Executive Secretary, Vasme. I, Megha Chadda, heartily welcome Mr. Rajiv Suri, partner RNA Technology and IP Attorneys, for contributing his valuable and precious time to make available for organizing live webinar on IP due uh, diligence. By special, my special, special thanks to Mr. Rajiv Suri and Ms. Shabnam Khan for partnering Vasme in this webinar. I also welcome all the dignitaries who have taken out their valuable time to contribute in this webinar. Let me brief about Vasme, a global organization having member representative in more than 100 countries, spearheading the cause and development and promotion of SMEs worldwide through policy advocacy, information dissemination, conferences, seminars, events, trainings, publication link, network linkages, and many more since 1980. Wasme has the consultative and observer status of United Nations. Rajiv is the partner with the firm RNA Technology and IP Attorneys. He heads the prosecution practice of the firm along with transactional work involving IP commercial laws. He has intensive experience of more than 25 years in handling the intellectual property matters, which which, uh, which enter earlier include portfolio management assisting Fortune 500 companies safeguard their IP assets. Rajiv has supervised and handled numerous opposition, cancellation, and informants enforcement actions involving intellectual property issues. Rajiv is also an expert at handling commercial agreements relating to foreign collaboration and joint ventures related royalty payment and licensing issues involving intellectual property. I'm not going in detail. May I invite Mr. Rajiv Suri to share his thoughts in IP on IP due diligence. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Warm welcome to you, sir. Mike, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this welcome. Um, first of all, let me thank Vasmi for giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm highly obliged. Uh, today, uh, and, and also I welcome all the delegates, all the audience uh, who have taken out time to be here in this webinar. So my, my topic for today is due diligence in IP. Uh, many of you perhaps would know what IP is. My today's presentation would cover these seven aspects which relate to due diligence. I start off with uh, what are the IPRs. Secondly, I come over to what is due diligence in IP. Then on to who are the IP owners or holders. After that, what are the contracts involved with reference to due diligence and IP? What are the important questions that are required to be asked with reference to due diligence and IP? What is the specific checklist? And a couple of examples, how we can assess due diligence in a particular scenario. Now, when I talk about what are intellectual property rights, these are classified into various categories. And obviously, there are, to begin with, intellectual property rights can be classified as something which are generated out of one's intellect. And to begin with, it's like a trademarks. Now, when I talk about trademarks, the trademarks are something which basically are the source identifiers for a particular business or commercial venture. It can be for a product or a service. 
Now, these trademarks are further classified into various, you know, forms and shapes. It's like you can have a name, shape, slogan, symbol, word or logo, word logo, word or trademark combined, uh, combined together, the logo combined together, the colors. And there are very non-traditional trademarks as well, uh, such as sound and smells. They can, they, they can also form as a trademark, though the level of distinctiveness, distinctiveness is very high for such marks. Then we move on to copyrights. When we talk about copyrights, these are again classified into different categories. The literary works which talk about you know, something which comes out of one's intellect. Authors have copyright in their books. Cinematographs, producers have their copyright in cinematographic films. Artistic work, painters have copyright on their artistic works. Software codes, musicals, dramatic works. The third type of IP right is patents. When we talk about patents, we talk about inventions, the processes, the product formulations, the product patents, which are generally in relation to pharmaceutical products, new formulations, new technologies, anything to do with invention comes under the heading of patents. A lot of the time, people confuse with patents and trademarks together, even, even copyright to a certain extent. So these are basically classified intellectual property rights. Then moving on, there are also a category called domains. Now domains, as you know, are something which are in a way web addresses to particular sites. These also form can form as a part of the intellectual property rights. Designs, now the designs are more prevalent in situation, in, in, in especially in products and these, are basically the technical drawings we are talking about. Uh, obviously, the designs have to be very absolute and novel. Um, then comes the trade secrets, something which is like, you know, which is very secretive to a commercial venture, can be SOPs or anything which is for which businesses are based upon. A good example of trade secret would be a formulation of a soft drink, maybe, you know, Pepsi Coke. Geographical indications, again, something, it is also an intellectual property right, where a, association of, a certain association is given, you know, intellectual property right in a particular uh, product coming from that particular region. For a good example would be like Scotch whiskey coming out of uh, Highlands in Scotland. So these are the certain intellectual property rights we are looking at when it comes to you know conducting that due diligence now when we talk about due diligence in ip obviously we are talking about due diligence in those intellectual property rights which i just explained now what exactly is due diligence now it is it is basically an assessment of the quality and the quantity of the IP assets which are owned or licensed by an IP holder. Whenever any commercial venture is there, it has to have an IP if it has to move forward. So this is basically an assessment. Secondly, it is also checking the particulars or rather details of the intellectual property rights. What assets the commercial venture owns is what we are, what we need to look at when we are conducting the, the, the due diligence. And then obviously it is like, you know, we are also asserting the details, the validity of those IP rights, what exactly is involved in it, what are the statutory rights involved in it, if there is any registrations obtained for it uh, in a particular jurisdiction, we need to look at that. And thirdly, it is also assessing the valuation of the intellectual property rights in a commercial venture. So these are basically the three aspects of due diligence when we are conducting an IP we need to look at. Now when we talk about 
intellectual property rights we are talking about who are the people or who are the entity which are owning these ip rights now these are this is not an exhaustive list which i present here it is like you know you can have additions to it these are basically the categories which i have classified and under which the intellectual property rights generally are owned by these eight or eight uh, uh, setups first of all comes obviously the individual individuals and in individuals you can have our authors scientists even a common man if 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 if, uh, if he or she carries on any you know commercial venture then comes the msmes the micro small medium enterprises big corporations mncs governmental organizations pharmaceutical companies obviously uh, pharma pharma companies they have a big portfolios and you know they can have both patents trademarks and even copyrights designs whatever uh, comes into play then comes the uh, academic institutions colleges schools hospitals nursing home clinics franchise businesses and traders now obviously this is not an exhaustive list but but these are primarily the constituents of ip holders or the ip owners now what are the contracts when we are talking about contracts when we are talking about you know issues involved with reference to due diligence and ip what are the basic nature of contracts we are looking at first of all and foremost is the assignment transmission documents now when we talk about assignment transmission of documents we talk about basically the transfer of rights one from one entity to the other and there are certain criteria which are to be looked at for a valid assignment under indian laws now for the assignment to be valid one has to have a consideration involved in it which is a transactional value in a assignment deed which is mentioned in the deed of assignment now this consideration value has to be there to assess the stamp value which is payable to the government of india which varies between 3 to 7% of the amount mentioned in the assignment deed so one has to look at whether or not this criteria is met when you are, when one is looking at the assignment in a in a commercial venture of any transfer of ownership when we talk about transmission transmission again talks about um, the situations where a company has merged into other company and what we need to look at if the there is any scheme of amalgamation which has been approved by any court of law in india and these situations we need to look at for the assignment transmission documents when we are taking a look at them and obviously we need to assess if the assignment has been conducted with or without the goodwill of the business in which a certain ip has been used then comes the licenses granted to use ip licenses are basically the temporary transfer of rights where a a license a, a license or uh, the person or the individual or the entity which is owning ip transfers temporary use of that particular ip to the licensee and in return they they get paid some royalty amounts uh for for use of that ip then comes the franchise agreements <coughs> sorry then comes the franchise agreements which is also the independent branch of franchiser now like franchise agreement is also a form of a licensing arrangement but the basic difference is that in franchise you license the the, the business model and you can run that franchisee as an independent unit whereas in license which is visa vis the ip it is for the products and services but here you in the franchise agreements you are looking at franchising the entire business model then comes the technical know how agreements now these are the kind of agreements where you transfer the technology from one entity to the other and you can also look at the you know aspects 
what exactly went into the transfer, what is the kind of monies which are involved in transfer technology, what are the remunerations involved in it, what are the technicians' uh, fees or compensation which is to be paid in these technical know-how agreements when you transfer a certain technology. Then comes the joint venture agreements. Now, when we talk about joint venture agreements, these are again a part of technical know-how agreements where, or rather the technical know-how agreements are part of these joint venture agreements where you need to look at all aspects of the business which is going to be set up. Um, a good example of joint venture ag agreements would be Hero Honda, where a Japanese corporation ties up with the Indian company, although this tie up is not relevant anymore. But then these are, this is a form of joint venture we are talking about. Then we talk about third party contract manufacturing agreements, where we talk about where uh, an entity co contracts the manufacturing of a particular product to a third party. And obviously it is done under a form of an agreement with the third party, which details out the use of the IP, the, the affixing of the IP on the products and what manner or extent the use of IP is allowed under that third party contract manufacturing agreement. And this is, these kind of agreements are very much prevalent amongst the pharmaceutical companies. And lastly comes the non-disclosure agreements, which again uh, are, are, are form of uh, you know agreements where you tend to give some sort of information to the other side and take an undertaking from them not to disclose it. So these are these are the kind of contracts we are looking at when it comes to uh, due diligence, conducting those due diligence in IP, and these are also the agreements which included. Then we come on to the important questions that are required to be asked with reference to due diligence and IP. When, whenever a due diligence is being conducted, we need to assess it. So these are the questions we need to ask. First of all is, what are, what are the, what, what IP we are looking at? Identify, we need to identify all the, own the license IP. Then we need to identify also any gaps which can make IP invalid or un unenforceable. Now, when we when we look at this aspect, we look at the you know validity of the IP, whether or not IP is registered. If it is registered, then if it has been renewed, when it when the renewal due date, uh, whether or not it has been renewed according to the expiry date, um, these are the gaps. If it has not been renewed then what is the grace period which is there for its renewal or if the grace period has already been passed then whether we can reapply it so these are the certain things we need to look at documentation as to the ownership of IP rights is very important and it is very essential that we look at the registration part of it the registration documents if there are any we need to look at that um, then comes the any litigation which may have been involved in which may have arisen involving the IP. Again, we need to look at because we don't want to get into a situation where we we took over we take over a business and then we find that you know the IP has already been challenged. So we need to be very careful about this issue. Then again, if any notice has been received from the third party for for infringement of their rights and how the matter was resolved, because this will help us to assess if any future conflict can arise or not. The settlement has to, be, uh, has to be seen from that point of view. Now, what is the specific checklist when we are looking at the due diligence? Again, the ownership and life cycle of a given product in IP. Now, this is very, very much important when we are looking at the, you know, uh, from the point of view of pharmaceutical products, very important. Uh, secondly, we are looking at the validity of the trademarks and patents if granted at this stage of prosecution. If any, obviously, all most of these IPs, they have uh, concerned authorities where you can go and register them. So this is like, you know, very much uh, 
uh, our due diligence, part of the due diligence, if we are aware that if it has been filed, then what is the stage of prosecution? And if, if it has been, you know, if registered, what is the validity period and, and all? Then comes the licensees of the specific IP. Now, if there are any licenses being issued for use of, the, use of that IP, then you need to assess, look at what are, who all are the licensees who are allowed to use that IP. Then has the company has a part of the new product launch done FTO search. Now, when we talk about this FTO search, now these are very much relevant in pharmaceuticals. And <clears throat> what we are talking about is FTO is freedom to operate search. Now in situations, especially when we talk about patents in pharmaceuticals, even if the patent is granted, there might be a situation where post grant, the situations may arise of conflict where a particular party may come up and challenge the use of that particular patent, even if it has been granted protection on the basis that a claim which is there in the patent infringes upon the already claim, which is uh, a claim which is already there for a existing patent. So it is very important to conduct this freedom to operate search if one has to you know, um, be given this. And these, these FTO searches are conducted by the people who are specialists in this IT field. Then has any trademark patents of the company challenged in any court of law? Again, this is a very specific check checklist we need to look at. Any trade secrets? which has been captured by the company by way of contractual obligation which employees are in this. When we talk about these, we need to look at if what, what sort of a contract which has been entered into with the employees of a company when, when we talk about you know, uh, looking at the due diligence, if all the trade secrets, all the uh, situations have been looked into or taken care of while drafting those agreements and lastly obviously comes the table of royalty if any received by the company for use of this ip when these are licenses involved so now i move on to certain examples where we can look at how a due diligence comes into play when in in in, in real time situations now here is a product which is basically a water purifier. And here, what all you can look at? Firstly, is your trademarks. What exactly the trademark is involved? The ownership and the validity. Obviously, this is a scientific product or a, or a, or a product which is like, you know, involves uh, a basically a scientific uh, process. And obviously, it would also be having a path Pattern to it. Now, what is the filtration process it followed? Whether chemical or membrane filtration, whether that process has, has been patented. <coughs> Sorry. Validity of patents obtained, if any. FTO search, which is conducted and opinion obtained, if any. Obviously, like I said in the earlier slide, that FTO is a very important aspect of any patent if it has to be used freely in the open market. Then comes the design part. If any technical drawings have been, you know, given a design registration, any unique aspect to it. And if the design registration has been obtained, then what is the validity or the, uh, if, if, it, if, if it has been, you know, a valid design, what is the registration documented? What is the period of that validity of the design registration? I may add here that design registration is valid for a period of 10 years and it gets extended by another five years. So we can look at that as well. Any copyright which is involved, like there might be a manual for it, you know, the product literature and all, obviously there is a copyrighted aspect as well. Now, this is again a pharma product we are talking about, which is an ointment. 
uh, of, a, of a common sense skin infection, we are again talking about tra trademark and here the main trademark is, you know, Betno weight. And the house mark is GSK, we are, we are talking about. Again, we need to look at the ownership and the validity, the patents involved in it, chemical composition, whether generic or not. If it is generic, then obviously we don't have to worry about. Uh, generic means that it is in the common domain. If it is a patentable product, then obviously we need to have uh, going for, you know, look at if the FTO search was done and the opinion obtained from the concerned lawyers. Validity of patent if, it, if obtained. Thirdly, obviously, comes to copyright the packaging, the whole the whole packaging of the product if it has been copy if copyrighted. The design layout of the 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 whole design layout of the tube or a, or a product if it has been you know given a design registration. And again, the design registration, any validity or any uh, documented right has been achieved for that design. So this is. This is my presentation. Here I end it. And this is will this, I hope it has given you a certain idea as to how the due diligence works in IP. Over to you, Mega. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for question answers, yes, sir. If you have any any kind of uh, means, uh, queries, you can just clarify your doubts and all. Rajiv, uh, uh, before the participants will move forward uh, with a question, I am having a question, sir. Uh, sure. As you know that uh, MSMEs are the backbone of our organ, I mean, so economy, and they 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 are having the 99 percent industries here. And whenever we are just talking about the micro, means uh, turnover less than five crores, an investment uh, less than one crore. So they are the very uh, small form. And they, they, they constitute 95%, more than that. So, and they are having good products also. So what is the simple way to get uh, or, 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 or complete a due diligence? That is one question that you can also I mean, clarify their doubts also. See, when it comes to uh, conducting due diligence in terms of, you know, simplest way is to look at the IP, the ownership of the IP. And if it is, you know, like, for example, the government in today's to today's date has given a lot of incentives to MSMEs to the extent that a, 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 a micro small medium enterprise can also seek registration, let's say, of a trademark at a very concessional rate, which is half the official fees which a normal uh, individual or an entity would be paying. Now, to, to just to give you an example, if one has to go in for a, let's say, a trademark registration, one needs to pay nine thousand rupees if one is filing online uh, and which comes to approximately 125 dollars but when it comes to you know the ministry of startups or msmes the 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 the, the, the government has given a concessional rate of just rupees 4500 half so it is like you know it is always when you are conducting this due diligence, one of the things which is there is document your rights. And that's very important. And the other, other step which has been taken by the government in this regard is that the government has on the Ministry of Startup put up, you know, the list of trademark and patent facilitators where they have named around 
I think 400 odd uh, patent and trademark facilitators where you need to, the, the MSME would only need to bear the official fee. The government takes part, takes uh, benefit or, 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 you know, the takes the uh, burden of paying the professional fee to the concerned professional. So these are the certain steps which can be taken. And obviously, uh, documentation of the uh, rights is one of the simplest steps to take. Very good, sir. Thank you. And uh, you have already given very wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, intellectual property is very, very important. Very, very important. So you have already mentioned, I think, trademark, logo, patent, and other things in the intellectual property right. I am the micro uh, organization now, suppose, I am having. And uh, we have got uh, two products over here. And which one is the simplest? And uh, means, uh, that is that is that we can protect the right of that particular product. That is the see it, when it comes to protecting those kind you know, the trademarks. Uh, there are certain criteria which are to be met in terms of seeking registration for it. Anything which is a coined term or an invented word can easily go through as a trademark. It should not have any connection with the products or services. Now, let's say if you have two trademarks, one of which is coined and the other one is, let's say, a dictionary word, then my suggestion would be to seek registration for an invented word because this is like something which is uh, which can easily be registered. It has it has the inherent distinctiveness qualities and will not be objected to by the registrar. In so far as the dictionary word is concerned, this can also have an inherent, inherent distinctive value vis-a-vis -vis the goods of services which we need to assess. Because there might be certain situations where such words may have any direct reference to the good character or quality of the goods in question and thus may not be registrable except a one evidence of wide distinctiveness which has to be proved with the help of prior use in the trade thank you any so we question? have uh, two questions we have we have two questions in the chat box uh, one is yes, from Ruchita Singh. How is copyright applicable to logo design? Reference to the last slide. Reference to the? Last slide, sir. Last slide. Last slide. Okay. So what we yes, are talking sir. about here is yeah what we are talking about is the copyright which is there in the entire trade dress the entire copyright the get up of the product this is how the copyright is relevant here and what we are looking at is we are we are trying to here copyright the entire presentation of the product this is how it the the the, the, the relevance of the entire color scheme the entire placement of features come into play Thank you for your answer, sir. I hope, uh, Ruchita ji, yes. you got your answer. So we have next question also. We have one question from Rishab Roy ji. Copyright yeah. of any literary works or publication is valid for 60 years after the demise yes. of author. If yes. I'm not wrong, how come we prevent uh, infringement of unfair publication by another person if it is not registered see uh, let me tell you copyright when you are, when we are talking about copyright it is not mandatory for you to seek a copyright registration the moment you produce anything and you would have seen that lot of uh, in lot of situations 
people use C within a circle on a cop which indicates that this is a copyrighted material. It does not necessarily indicate that this is a mark which has been copyrighted as a documented right. This is the beauty of the copyright. This is there is a difference when it comes to trademarks because in trademarks the law provides for that the use of the symbol R within a circle can only be there if the trademark is registered. That means it is a documented right. But in copyright, this is not the situation. So it is not necessary for you to have a documented right in copyright. But yes, if you have a documented right, it helps you and serves you better in a court of law. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Rishabh Royji, I hope we had answered very well. So we have next question, sir. Uh, the person, uh, Atishri, he have two questions. How us royalty calculated uh, for ATM? And the other question is, how is the 3 to 7% of stamp duty calculated on TM assignment? Yeah. So I'll answer the first question, uh, the second question first. Now this is uh, when you're talking about three to seven percent of the payment on this uh, on, on the deed of assignment. Now these are the values which have been adjudicated upon by the stamp duty, uh, uh, the, the Indian Stamp Act. And it depends upon the jurisdiction wise. When you talk about three percent, it is generally Delhi jurisdiction we are talking about. 5% is Bombay and then uh, 3 to 5% is in Bombay. I think 5% is in Bombay and then 7% is in Chennai. So this is how the, it all depends upon the jurisdiction when we are talking about the percentage wise. Now coming to the second, uh, the first question, which is like how you evaluate the royalty. Now this is a very subjective term, very subjective. Uh, uh, there's a very subjective answer to it. It is, it, there is a valuation which is done in terms of, you know, how you value a particular trademark. Now, there are a lot of factors when you are valuing a particular trademark. Most of these factors are dependent upon the extent and the volume of use of that particular trademark in a particular trade. And that is how the valuation is done. And there are specialist valuers who value these, uh, who attack, attach the value to these trademarks and accordingly they assess the royalty payments uh, which are to be assessed based on those valuations. Now this is a very complex process of valuating a particular trademark, giving it a particular value and then, you know, arriving at a particular royalty payments. Um, so there is no general fixed rule to it. It all, it is very subjective in nature, taking into account various factors. Okay, sir, thank you so much. Thanks for the wonderful answer. We have next question, sir, from Dushyan Sahani ji. Uh, he want to ask question related to the copyright. Is it as advisable to get your copyright registered or just publishing of the copyrighted work is enough? See, in my view, it is it is uh, better to have a documented right because uh, tomorrow, if any you you if if there is any action to be taken based on that copyright, the first thing, especially when it comes to you know, taking a, a route of criminal litigation or, for that matter, civil litigation, if you have a documented right, it becomes easier for the judges and for the magistrates to pass orders based on those documented rights. So I think it is very much in, in your interest to seek a copyright registration, because in that case, you will have a documented right to yourself. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So Atishri ji wanted to know, are there government authorized valuers to value IPRs? What is the authenticity of the valuation done? 
see so yes there are there are valuers uh there are i'm not sure of the government valuers but yes there are there are people who are specialized in valuing valuation of these trademarks and there are specialist firms which do that so just to give you an example uh, kingfisher airlines vijay malya i think perhaps you may also know kingfisher airlines as a trademark was valued at 3000 crores by a firm called grant and thorton which was a uk based firm and on the basis of that uh, mr malya could secure loans from from the banks and that valuation how authentic it is then obviously one needs to assess it from the point of view of what factors were taken into while as giving giving a particular trademark that kind of value so yes authenticity is always there but one needs to also look at what were the factors which were taken into account when such a value was given um a uh, 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 trademark was given such a value thanks a lot sir thanks a lot and i don't think so we have more questions now and big round of applause for you sir rajiv sir thank you so much so we'll proceed you, further sir. towards the uh, vote of thanks mega mega i have one question uh, okay sir okay sir please uh, carry on sir yes yes sir rajiv i am writing a book uh, i am also author of uh, one book so i am just going to uh, have the copyright as you have suggested only the c at the power that is not sufficient you need to have the red mark also so what is the process simplest process uh, to see, just I've, have the copyright yeah. first of all i need to clarify when you when you talk about copyright you specifically talk about copyright uh your, your book can be copyrighted uh the simplest process is to file an application for it there is a form 4 which is which is there on the uh, the where you need to put in the uh, fill in the particulars uh in in that format which is given by the copyright office and then pay a fee on it within um if there is any objection to it or if there when the application gets scrutinized if i if there are any objections raised by the copyright office we clear that out and once we meet those objections successfully the 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 copyright is granted now the whole process takes around 6 to 8 months time and what they give you is a certificate and plus a stamp which is affixed on your book which talks about the which is a which is basically a stamp of the copyright office that this this shows that this is a copyrighted work so sure, thank you wonderful wonderful yeah 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 yeah, yeah you can uh, proceed for vote of thanks thank you so much sir i on behalf of world association for small and medium enterprises it's a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all guest speakers participants and wasmi team I would like to thank our distinguished speaker Mr Rajiv Suri for making excellent presentation and making this webinar interesting and meaningful. I would uh, I would like to express our profound gratitude to Ms Shabnam Khan for her presence in this webinar. I would also like to thank our honorable secretary general Dr G P Agarwal and Dr Sanjeev Lag executive secretary Vasme for support and guidance. Once again thank you all of you for making this webinar successful with your contribution thank you so much sir thank you thank and you I would so much to request thank all you. the thank participants you. to fill the feedback form thank you so much thank you mega thank, so thank you much and thank you thank you thank you thank you so much and thank you so much vasmi with for giving us this opportunity to be here today for this webinar pleasure sir pleasure Thank you so much.